Hang on one more second. Uh, and actually, um, city planning is here. If you can promote them. I'll get them while Roberta goes ahead. And I'm all set now. Thank you. Go ahead. So hi, committee members. So um, this year, the budget and strategy committee has created a shorter timeline. So um, we're, we're going to, we're asking each committee in April to start the planning process, to start planning to meet with, with share stakeholders. Um, we're looking for um, meetings with stakeholders in, in May and June, and that by July, the committee will vote on their budget priorities and finalize their district needs. Uh, traditionally, land use doesn't really have any budget priorities. You might this year just because of the, the pandemic. Um, and we have some, we're only going to have total of 20 expense and 20 capital budget priorities. Anything that's anything more than that will be sent directly to a, um, the appropriate agency. So in the case of land use, it it's, would be the uh, Department of Buildings or, or um, city planning. Um, there are criteria for selecting the priorities. I won't read them. I've, I've sent them to the chairs and I will do a follow-up to all committee members this coming week. Um, so July, the committees vote on their budget priorities and finalize their district statement, district needs. Uh, the budget and finance committee will meet and decide, you know, pull everything together. In September, there will be a public hearing prior to steering to, to look at all the budget priorities. The steering committee will vote to prioritize the, the budget. And, and in October, the full board will vote on budget priorities. Um, one of the things we're asking people to look at is, it, so the budget priorities are for the fiscal year, July 2020 to June 23. We're asking committees to look at the budget in a new light because of the pandemic. We're also, um, and I'll send around the criteria, but I don't want to take your time up with that. And we're also hoping to create a database so that not only can um, all, all the budget priorities will be in the in the database and we can follow up as to what's been final, you know, what's been approved or hasn't been approved, as well as all the resolutions, so we can follow along with resolutions. So, you know, if you have a resolution about X, we once X has been um, taken up by the appropriate agency, it would then go into the database that it was finished, you know what the status is. Any questions? Okay. Sounds good. So we'll, we'll share the criteria and put this on next month's agenda. Perfect. And I will send a copy of all of our notes to every committee member. But in, in anticipation of that, I, I just, you know, we have not traditionally had any uh, budget items, right. but uh, I want to raise in, in May the issue of whether we should ask for funding uh, to assist in uh, the comprehensive planning that's being proposed. That, that's a good idea. And then you'd want to prioritize. So what we're asking is each committee prioritize their funding requests. If you only have one, then obviously that's your top priority. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, I see uh, Nabil is here. Yeah, wait one second, Rich. I, I just wanted to give a, a little update to those who uh, don't know. F following last month's meeting, we did send a letter to the Department of Buildings regarding weekend construction permits and noise. And uh, to our delight, DOB was very responsive and responded back with another letter uh, right away. And to the best of our understanding, no additional permits have been per, uh, provided since late uh, February or early March. And DOB said that they would look into more detailed why the permits were issued and 
add a little more scrutiny to it. Um, so I just wanted to let folks know that. Also, we're not discussing this tonight, but I, I wanted to let people know that we got a request from the city council that and community board nine that wanna to come to our committee uh, next month to talk about their rezoning plans that may affect portions of CB7. And also we had a brief call with the developer for the project mid block on West 96th Street, Fetner, and they hope to come to us in June or July and they'll be building affordable housing units there as per their agreement through the disposition of city-owned property. Um, so those are things coming up. One, one other uh, item before we get to the uh, ULERP item. Um, if many of you, most of you will recall that in 2019, the board uh, voted to support legislation then pending at, at the state level uh, do we do that to, new business though? Well, the, let, let's, as long as we're doing minor okay. things, let's do it. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the legislation addresses the issue of these voids that make two tall buildings that much taller. Uh, the board, I mean, the committee went through the legislation, the board, the committee approved it, the board approved it. The legislation went nowhere in 2019, but it has now been revived in uh, the state, in the Senate, and the Assembly. Uh, and uh, our thought, uh, Jeanette and I, and, and after talking with Steve, our thought was uh, we don't need a new <coughs> resolution reiterating what we said in 2019, but that it would be appropriate for uh, the committee and Steve to uh, send a letter to the legislature, uh, just uh, reiterating that we still approve it and, and it's it's become more uh, important than ever. Shelley? I checked with both Linda Rosenthal's office and Jackson's office, because they're the sponsors, and it's the identical, almost the identical um, uh, text. Uh, there's nothing substantially different. So that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I read it. I couldn't discern any differences. So and, and, and if no one has any objection, that's what we're going to do. Great. Hearing none. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> we now get to the main course. Nabila <laughs> Malik from City Planning has been uh, kind enough to join us on and, and present an issue that is in Europe at the present time and maybe even a preview of other matters that the city planning is uh, working on that affect us. Nabila, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I just, uh, I'm sorry, there is a constant noise of someone in the background. I don't know if others are hearing of shouting. Yeah, it's, or it's good policy to everybody would mute if, yeah. unless you're speaking. That's right. it's, it's actually quite distracting. I hope I'm not the only one, but it's fairly noisy. Thank you. Okay, I think it's better. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having us at this meeting. It's good to see you all. Um, as you may know, city planning has been working on a few citywide proposals that we will be sharing with you in the coming months. Um, the first proposal we have in front of you today uh, was certified on April 5th, and it's called Zoning for Accessibility, and it was developed in collaboration with MTA. Um, so today I'm joined by my colleagues, Azka Mohudin and Chris Lee from the Department of City Planning and Leah Flax and Munson Park from the MTA. Um, they will go through a brief overview of the zoning text amendment, which aims to improve ADA access throughout the city. Um, and if you want to hear more information about any aspect of the proposal, we're gonna stay for questions. Um, there's also a detailed project summary and an annotated zoning text um, on the website. Um, so I'll, I'll share the link um, for that with you as well. And um, we'll follow up with any questions we weren't able to answer today. Um, we're asking for your recommendation for the City Planning Commission. Um, and 
official recommendations from all 59 of the community boards, borough boards, and the borough presidents are requested by um, June 14th. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, can I, do I need? Um, give me one second, I'm sorry. I didn't okay. know you wanted to do that. No, it's okay. So now give it a try, you should have the power. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Azka, who um, is my colleague at City Planning and she'll be walking through this presentation with you as she's been closer to the content um, as, it, as it was being developed than I was. Um, Azka. Hello everyone, and thanks for having us here and thanks Sabila for the introduction. Um, so I am from the uh, Department of City Planning and I will be going over the zoning portion of uh, the proposal and the introduction for this will be given by um, Leah Flax from MTA. So I'm gonna have her take over for now. Thank you, Aska, and thank you very much to CB7 for having us here today. Nice to see a couple of faces I recognize from the Transportation Committee. Commissioner Albert, hello. Hi, um, Leah. I'm just gonna be doing a couple slides before we hand it over uh, to DCP to get into the real details and meat of it. Um, so starting with the next slide, what is Elevate Transit? Well, to put it simply, it is a zoning text amendment, citywide zoning text amendment, and it will allow the MTA to work more efficiently with private developers to help achieve system-wide accessibility more quickly than we can do on our own. There are two main parts to the text amendment. One is system-wide transit easement requirement, and the second is expanded transit improvement bonus in high density areas, um, which DCP is going to explain in more detail. So um, next slide, what is the current state of things? Well, our system, as you know, was built a long time ago. Most of our stations were built before 1950. And though we've made progress in increasing the number of accessible stations, there's still a long way to go. So of the subway and central rail stations, there are 493, 136 of those are accessible. That is, for anybody doing the math, about 28% of stations. And within the five boroughs where we have railroad, Long Island and Metro North railroad stations, 25 out of 39 of those within the city are accessible. Um, and just to mention, ADA accessible stations include many features to make them accessible uh, and usable by individuals with disabilities. And zoning for accessibility is specifically focused on uh, increasing vertical accessibility. Um, next. So what does, uh, who's impacted when there aren't elevators throughout our system, people with disabilities, parents with young children, seniors, and people with temporary injuries. So for those folks who rely on an elevator, something that could take someone else a few minutes, could take them hours as they have to navigate between the different stations that are actually uh, ADA accessible. And that impact, those people who are impacted by that lack of accessibility, well, right now um, of 8.4 million residents in the city, about a quarter of them are impacted. So with about half a million have an ambulatory disability, half a million are children under five, and 1.2 are residents over 65. And we see those numbers increasing based on demographic trends. Um, between 2005 and 2015, the number of New Yorkers over 65 grew by 19.2%. So that's more than twice the rate that the overall population was growing. So uh, this is something that MTA takes quite seriously and we have made a historic commitment to accessibility in our latest capital plan. Um, it committed more than 5 billion 
to increase the number of accessible stations by 77. When those stations are done, we'll have 43 instead of the 28%, well, 43% of stations accessible. And if you look at where people are riding, that's about 60% of riders. In CB7, that includes 81st Street and 96th Street on the BC 8th Avenue lines. Um, and once we get those 77 stations done, we will achieve our goal of having no subway rider more than two stations away from an accessible station. We're really looking you know, at stations throughout the city trying to make it equitable. Um, and here's a picture of what one of our newest subway stations looks like in Brooklyn with this beautiful uh, glass canopy. And I just have one more slide just to talk about some of the challenges that we have in addition to um, the cost, we have a lot of physical and design challenges um, from narrow platforms to narrow sidewalks um, and something that we really face throughout the city and certainly in Manhattan is um, having to uh, build them out in the street where there is tons of underground utilities and infrastructure. So um, adjacent to your board at 57th Street, where we're building 57th Street and 7th Ave, where we're currently building an elevator, we're literally relocating utilities in two blocks in, in either direction because that's what you have to do to make space where you can actually put a hole in the ground for an elevator. So just to say that it is, um, it's quite complicated work. Um, and also I want to add that many stations to make them accessible re will require more than one elevator as you think about going from street to mezzanine and from mezzanine potentially to two different platforms depending on the line. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to DCP to talk about, well, what would zoning for accessibility do to make these alleviate some of these construction challenges um, and help accelerate accessibility in the subway system? Thank you, Leah. Um, so as Leah went over some of these goals for accessibility that the city has, um, we're going to first look at what the zoning currently allows um, to meet these goals. Specifically, we have two um, transit related zoning provisions in place today. Um, and that is what uh, zoning for accessibility is seeking to expand on. Uh, the first is the transit easement requirement. And the second is the station improvement bonuses. These tools leverage station access improvements in places where investment is already occurring. So they ensure that opportunities for coordinating developments that and station improvements are evaluated and realized. Um, as a result, they speed up delivery of transit improvements and we get a better designed station inside with a better sidewalk environment outside because the station entrance has been located off the sidewalk. However, these current provisions have certain limitations that CFA is aiming to address. Next slide. Uh, first, looking more in depth, in depth into the current easement provisions, um, they address challenges of locating new station entrances and other transit amenities. An easement is a legal right to use another's land for a specific limited purpose. In other words, it is a small permanent space reserved in a building for a transit agency to use in the future. Transit easements have traditionally been used to provide space for new station entrances, passageways, or ancillary facilities that support subway lines such as emergency egress or ventilation structures. However, in the zoning resolution today, these provisions have very limited coverage and only apply in a few areas in the city such as along 2nd Avenue for the 2nd Avenue subway line. Also, the zoning resolution does not currently provide a consistent citywide approach for facilitating transit easements on development sites around transit stations. As a result of these limitations, there have been missed opportunities for MTA to locate ADA access at optimal locations on development sites next to a station. The image on the slide right now shows one of these opportunities um, in Brooklyn. Next slide. Um, second, looking at the um, transit bonus mechanism in the zoning resolution, it that was created to um, support the creation of transit improvements. 
So in the densest commercial districts in the city, we have incentivized developers to both provide the space and to construct the station improvements, including ADA access through floor area bonuses that provide additional development rights. As with easement provisions though, transit bonus mechanisms are also limited to a handful of areas in or near our central business districts. Within this limited geography, only sites next to a st subway station can take advantage of the standard subway improvement bonus program. Additionally, the current process associated with obtaining a transit bonus involves considerable public review, adding time and risk to the, de the development schedule. All of these factors have limited the number of subway bonus applications we've ever seen to date. Next slide. To address some of the limitations of these zoning provisions, we are proposing zoning for accessibility. The proposal seeks to create more opportunities for accessibility throughout this transit system through expanding these zoning tools available to us. Next slide. CFA is proposing to expand the transit requirements system-wide to most station adjacent sites and provide zoning flexibility on sites where easements are provided to offset potential burdens on development feasibility. Um, it is also increasing uh, participation in the transit bonus program by increasing its area of applicability to other high density areas in the city. Next slide. The first component of this proposal is the system-wide easement requirement that would assist MTA and other transit agencies with identifying opportunities for locating future transit access points and other station facilities. As part of this requirement, all developments and enlargements on zoning lots within 50 feet of a mass transit station and in applicable zoning districts would need to file a, an application with the MTA and the chairperson of the city planning commission to determine whether an easement on the zoning lot is needed to help facilitate station access improvements in the future. While the process of obtaining a certification would be required for most sites within 50 feet of a transit station, it is anticipated that MTA will only ask for an easement in limited spaces that are the most optimal for future transit access around each station. Um, next slide. So what does this mean for Community District 7 is shown in this illustrative map. Um, it shows where ZFA would be applicable. Um, the red line shows the boundary of CD7, the neon green dots, which in CD7 um, only includes the 103rd Street Station, shows where the proposed easement requirement would be in place, um, is currently in place. And the blue dots show stations where both the proposed easement and bonus would be, uh, the blue dots show the stations where both the proposed easement and the bonus would be applicable. Only the lots shown in orange that would be eligible for the bonus provision because they are within 500 feet of an eligible station and um, in a high density uh, zoning district. Um, for the purpose of understanding the implications of the easement requirements uh, for CD7, every station has some area of applicability. The dark green areas on the map shows zoning lots within 50 feet of an eligible station where an easement may be required for all developments or enlargements. Next slide, please. Now, if it is determined that a transit easement is needed on a zoning lot, an easement volume would be reserved and the owner would be required to provide temporary construction access when the transit agency is ready to construct improvements. But that construction improvement is not a requirement on the, the owner itself. Next slide. The transit agency in consultation with the developer and the chairperson of the city planning commission would determine the necessary easement for future station upgrades. Depending on the needs of the individual station, transit easements could vary in shape and size. Um, the vertical volume of an easement could occupy several floors depending on the elevation of the station. Underground subway stations could occupy multiple levels below grade, whereas elevated transit stations could take up a number of floors above grade. The horizontal footprint of an easement could also vary depending on the size um, and type of access that is needed. For example, an elevator could take up less space, whereas a new station entrance that requires a staircase, elevator, and turnstiles could require a larger easement volume. 
There are also different types of easements depending on whether it is intended to provide a future station access point or in other instances, sub, uh, substations, which typically warrant larger volumes in the cellar level of a development. Next slide. Because of this variation in easement shapes and size, easement areas can affect development sites in a number of ways. The easement can take a floor space on the site and can reduce available floor area for the development itself. Um, it can occupy a large amount of space within a development's building envelope or restrict ground floor uses and create compatibility issues with surrounding uses. Without any zoning relief, easements can limit construction of a development to its full potential. If the provisions of an easement make it challenging for a development to be built, it would be much more difficult for the transit agency to acquire the easement. Next slide, please. Therefore, in order to facilitate easement agreements in the future, um, targeted relief from certain zoning limits would be provided to minimize potential challenges for construction on a site subject to the proposed requirement. There are five general categories of provisions being proposed. Um, they include floor area and open space, height and setback, parking relief, use allowances, and st streetscape provisions. Um, I will now go over four of these provisions that apply in CD7. So the proposed floor area and open space relief is intended to allow developments to be constructed without losing their permitted buildable floor area due to an easement and to provide greater flexibility for locating easements and stations connections in the future. Floor space contained within easement volume would be excluded from the definition of zoning floor area. Transit easements would also be treated as permitted obstructions to provide flexibility in locating them on a site. Lock coverage, which regulates the amount of open space needed in a site would also be increased in certain districts to allow easements to be integrated more easily within buildings. Slide. The proposed height modifications would provide targeted building envelope flexibility in districts governed by maximum building height limits to facilitate the provision of easements and the permitted floor area on such development sites. To accommodate developable floor space elsewhere and around the easement volume, sites that provide an easement would be able to increase their maximum height by 10 feet. Um, this provision is increased to 20 feet for developments that provide an above grade easement in R7 districts and above. Before you go to the next slide, could you go back one slide, please? Yeah, um, you're going to want to update. Um, that slide because there is no V train anymore. <laughs> so um, it's a different service there now. Thank you, we will we'll get a better photo, thank you. Like thank EM you. and six. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, and so the other thing with the height and setback would be a street well flexibility, which would also be provided within 15 feet of an easement area to provide greater flexibility in articulating street walls around such volumes. Um, next slide. Um, use allowances are also proposed to activate spaces around future station entrances that will enhance the surrounding environment. Um, in some instances, an easement may not be improved immediately with a new station entrance and such volume could be left vacant for some time. To activate these vacant spaces, transit easements could be temporarily occupied by any permitted non-residential uses until such volume is needed by the transit agency. In residence districts, local retail uses could also be permitted as a temporary use. For those comp prom to promote complementary uses around easement areas and enhance sidewalk environments with future station entrances may be located, Local retail uses would be permitted within 30 feet around an easement in residence districts and within 30 feet on the second floor where above grade easements are provided. Similarly, permitted commercial uses would be allowed on the second floor where above grade easements are provided on sites with mixed use buildings and commercial districts. To allow commercial floor space to be accommodated more easily on sites with an above grade easement, such uses on the second floor would be allowed up to 30 feet in height within the rear yard. Next slide. 
Modifications to street uh, to streetscape requirements would be provided to ensure that rules pertaining to the ground floor or other elements affecting street design do not conflict with station design uh, requirements. Um, this includes um, easement energy would be therefore excluded from general streetscape provisions, uh, which include ground floor use regulations, transparency provisions, and planting requirements applicable in lower density districts or pursuant to quality housing requirements. The proposed streetscape provision would also ensure that developments are built appropriately around easement areas and future station entrances. To ensure safety of transit users entering and leaving station uh, entrances within designated easement areas, curb cuts will be restricted within 30 feet of an easement. Next slide. So in addition to the proposed regulations, additional relief may be needed to address unique site conditions that may create challenges for providing an easement. In other situations, certain developers may want to provide complementary circulation space around the easement in the form of additional open space that may warrant further modifications. Um, to allow for additional flexibility, further use, bulk parking, loading, and streetscape modifications would be available pursuant to discretionary review and approval. Depending on the amount of relief that is requested, modifications would either be subject to an authorization that would allow a height increase of up to 25% or through a special permit if more height relief is needed. Next slide. While the easement requirement may um, only applies to developments and enlargements on sites with a lot area of at least 5,000 square feet in applicable zoning districts, easements may also be provided voluntarily on other sites. For certain sites in the same applicable zoning districts where an easement is provided, zoning relief would apply. Specifically on small sites with a lot area of less than 5,000 square feet, the same set of relief applicable to required sites would apply to developments and enlargements providing an easement. On sites with an existing building that is being converted, targeted relief would be provided to facilitate the provision of an easement area within an existing building. In other instances, instead of a transit easement, the transit agency may need additional sidewalk space or a clear path around an existing or future subway station entrance where a clear path is provided, street wall flexibility would uh, apply to allow street walls to be located beyond the permitted distance from the street line or the street walls of adjacent buildings. Um, and that is the first part of the proposed ZFA. Uh, the second component of the proposal is an expanded transit bonus program that would be optional for sites that are, are proximate to a mass transit station. Um, as mentioned previously, um, today's subway bonus mechanism grants a floor area bonus of up to 20% on for a significant station improvement. The current bonus, however, only applies to station adjacent sites in the highest density commercial districts in the city. Because of the limited uh, applicability of this program and lengthy application review process needed to obtain such floor area bonus, only a handful of station improvements have been provided through this tool up to date. Next slide. To address the limitations of today's subway bonus mechanism, the proposed transit bonus program would continue to grant a floor area bonus of up to 20% of the maximum floor area ratio for developments and enlargements that construct station improvements. And it will expand the geography of areas where a transit bonus may be used. Such floor area bonus would be subject to a simplified discretionary review and approval process in the form of an authorization by the City Planning Commission. Next slide. The new bonus program would expand the applicability of the existing uh, subway bonus program to other high density areas and key business districts. The proposed bonus would expand the geography to other high density areas, including all R9 and R10 districts in the city, their commercial equivalent and M16 districts. The new transit bonus would allow sites that are within 500 feet of a station to participate in the program in exchange for an off-site improvement that would be constructed at a station that is not immediately adjacent to the site. This feature of the new bonus program to allow both on-site and off-site improvements would incentivize a greater number of developments to provide station improvements. Next slide. 
Um, this illustrative map shows the expansion of the bonus provision, specifically in Community District 7. Um, the blue dots show the current applicability, which only includes the Lincoln Center station at the moment. And the pink dots show the station, uh, stations where the proposed transit bonus would now be applicable. The orange color uh, shows the areas within 500 feet of those stations' uh, footprints that meet the zoning district requirements. Next slide. In order for a bonus floor area to be granted, the owner of the development site must construct a significant station improvement. Such improvements may vary and include a single or a variety of station upgrades. Where stations are inaccessible, ADA upgrades would be prioritized. Uh, examples include the construction of a single elevator, additional uh, station entrances, mezzanine expansion and platform upgrades, as well as additional signage and lighting. Um, the amount of floor area bonus is contingent on the degree to which improvements enhance access and station environment. The pro proportionality between the amount of additional floor area granted and station improvements provided varies depending on the individual station needs and their unique conditions. The floor area generated from the bonus may only be occupied once the MTA determines that such improvements are usable by the public. Next slide. For developments and enlargements providing a transit improvement, modifications to other zoning provisions would be available to pursuant to additional discretionary review and approval. Depending on the amount of relief that is necessary, modifications may either be subject to an authorization that would allow a height increase of up to 25% or through a special permit if further height relief is needed, um, other relief that would be made available through discretionary review and approval include modifications to use, parking, loading, and streetscape. Modifications pursuant to the authorization or special permit would be subject to specific findings. Um, this greater coverage of the expanded transit program, as well as this implication of the application process for most sites seeking a bonus would result in additional transit improvements and upgrades for ADA access. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, Zoning for Accessibility proposes um, a zoning tax amendment to establish a framework for coordinating the siting and provision of transit easements with new developments on adjacent sites. Where easements are needed, targeted relief from certain zoning limits will be provided to such developments and enlargements in order to minimize potential challenges for construction on a site subject to the proposed requirement. As part of that, for sites below 5,000 square feet or where conversions are proposed, the requirements would not apply, um, but they would be on a voluntary basis. And uh, similarly, zoning relief may be provided on those as well. In addition to the proposed set of relief, um, further use bulk parking loading and street modifications would be available pursuant to discretionary review and approval. Secondly, the tax amendment would also expand the transit bonus mechanism that would continue to grant floor area bonus of up to 20% to the maximum floor area ratio on, for developments and enlargements that construct station improvements. Um, and it will expand the geography of areas where this transit bonus may be used. For such sites providing a transit improvement, modifications to other zoning provisions will be available pursuant to additional discretionary review and approval. Next slide. As mentioned in the beginning, we are currently in the public review process of this text amendment. We're asking for your recommendations to the City Planning Commission about the proposal. Official recommendations from all 59 community boards, borough boards, and borough presidents are requested by June 14, 2021. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time, and we're happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, have, uh, raise hands for questions. Anyone have a question for any of them? Uh, Peter. Um, uh, I think this is a, a long time coming, I have to say. Um, I've done a lot of work for New York City Transit over the years and also a lot of um, residential construction. Um, just by, by way of history, we um, did the Montana apartments 
uh, between 87th and 88th Street on Broadway, uh, which was done some um, over 30 years ago, about 35 years ago. And at that time, I tried desperately to get New York City Transit to create an access point um, between 87th and 88th Street on Broadway because there was only, uh, this is on the northbound track, there was only one um, exit and entrance, uh, as everybody knows, on 86th Street and Broadway, which to this day is very crowded. Um, and we, uh, in fact, created space in our, the building we did, the Montana Apartments, to be able to uh, access the subway there. And I went to about 10, 12 meetings at New York City Transit, and they just refused to consider it. Um, the developer, a guy named Norman Siegel, was willing to do it even without adding uh, to the building, the Twin Towers uh, building on Broadway between 87th and 88th. So it shows you, I mean, I don't know exactly what purpose of my talking here is, except the history has been so awful. I mean, I've done a lot of work for New York City Transit. Um, we did the 72nd Street subway station and many others. And everyone was a huge effort just to get New York City Transit to understand what the future in New York City is like. And I, I really must applaud this final, this uh, new um, um, prospect of um, getting much better access to the subway by giving bonuses to developers. It's the right way to go. Uh, I hope it moves quickly, but the history has been just terrible up to date. Thank you, uh, Mark, and then Rich. Thanks. There were a couple of, uh, oh, I see Louisa has her hand too. Um, there were a couple of references to the uh, somewhat generous bonuses available under the proposal, but then uh, references to the possibility of, of even further bonuses um, uh, through pr discretionary approvals. In at least one of the slides I thought I saw, and please help me with this, um, that the approval would be through a chair's authorization, which is, if I recall correctly, a fairly streamlined process that doesn't have a lot of time for community board review and is not a full Euler. Um, is that when you talk in the other slides about, first of all, do I have that right? And secondly, um, is that the nature of discretionary approval um, that, uh, that you're referring to in other slides as well, or are there different flavors for different kinds of, of additional bonuses? Thanks. Um, yes, thank you for your question, Mark. Um, the bonus is up to 20%. So when we're saying additional modifications or additional relief, that is for other modifications that might be necessary to make that building happen as a result of that bonus that's been granted. So that includes height relief and other things. So the authorization would be for the, the bonus, which is up to 20%, and it would be for um, height relief up to 25%, but if anything beyond that is needed, that is when the discretionary review comes in. And that discretionary review is not just a uh, authorization. Um, if it might be um, uh, a special permit depending on what the relief uh, being sought is. I, 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 hi, everybody, I'm, I'm Chris Lee from the zoning division. And just to clarify, um, we have the easement provisions and um, the easements will be, um, and, and the relief provided are uh, part of a chair certification that is jointly certified between the MTA and the chair of the city planning commission. So that is not discretionary review. Um, what we're proposing beyond the certification are three discretionary um, actions, two authorizations and one special permit. As, as a, I take it the discretionary we, actions are subject to a special permit, which would go before the community board before it's permitted. Is that correct? The authorizations will also have to be referred out to the community board. So the authorizations are um, discretionary as well. Um, special, the special permit will be subject to full EULA, so it will have to go to city council. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
no worries. Uh, Mark, did you have any other? Thanks, that, that covers it, thank you. Okay, Rich, and then uh, Roberta, I mean, um, sorry, Rich, and then Louisa, and then Seema. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I agree, this sounds great. My question is the 20% or even 25% for height seems extremely tall. And given our concern about super talls, uh, it, it sounds like from what Peter said that you know, developers have an incentive to tap into the subway even with no benefit. So I'm wondering if it needs to be that high of a benefit. Uh, and then my second question is more a curiosity. Uh, obviously, um, accessibility for the subway is not an economic issue. It's a humanitarian issue. But I'm wondering if there are economic benefits from just reducing just what the cost of accessoride is and if there might be any economic benefits from reducing the need for accessoride or if that's minimal in the grand scheme of things. But my main question, as much for the, for the board as for the speakers, is why it needs to be 20 and even 25% in height uh, to get this done. I can answer. Go ahead, Chris. You're frozen. Oh, can, can people hear me? Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we made the authorization for additional modifications and height up to 25% um, because there may be certain situations where either for the easement or the um, uh, for the transit improvement bonus, where there may be odd you know, sites where it, it will be challenging for a developer to provide an easement or for a developer to fit um, up to 20% of an FAR increase on their site. So essentially what that is doing is to allow in certain situations where it's challenging um, for them to fit either the easement or the additional floor area um, if they were to pursue the transit improvement bonus. 25% and 20% are not, if you look at the 20% FAR bonus and 25% height increase, you wonder why it's there. They're different percentages. And one of the reasons why is because we have height and setback regulations, we have lot coverage. So it's not a one-to-one -one kind of a fit on a zoning lot. So the higher you go, there are more restrictions to um, limitations on the floor plate. So that's why you need a little more to retain the flexibility of these um, within these zoning districts to allow uh, for the uh, increase in floor area. Um, and to answer your other question about the like 20% seeming very high um, and the cost of these, um, the cost of making an, a station, um, you know, AD accessible is very high and it requires um, a lot from the developer because they will be, uh, you know, basically having to pay for the entire improvement and the improvement and to uh, justify that improvement or to incentivize them to even to consider doing that, they need something, um, you know, equivalent or a bit more that they will be getting back in return. So 20%, that's where the 20% comes from. And that's in line with our, the other current bonuses that, uh, you know, we offer in other, in the other bonus programs that uh, the zoning allows. Um, and I think you had a question about access a ride, which I'm, uh, somebody from MTA can handle. I, I, I think, um, hi, Mutsun Park from the MTA. Um, I would defer my, to my colleague Leah to try to answer that one since I, I'm from the Transit Oriented Development Group. Sorry, apologies. Um, my understanding is it would not be until all of the stations are accessible that we would not offer accessoride service it falls under the ADA and I'm not 100% certain. So I'd like to confirm and uh, get back to you. Thank you. Uh, Louisa and, and uh, Ethel and Seema, and I'm sorry, <laughs> go, go ahead. Okay, it's a, thank you. It's a very thorough presentation. First of all, I wonder if we will be able to retain this presentation so we should could check it because there was so much information in it now it seemed to um you're muted you got me to mute now 
I You're didn't on mute, touch Louise. it. Okay. I know I didn't touch it. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, if the height increase is twenty percent, it can actually be twenty five percent, and then with a special permit or an authorization, which go higher depending upon special circumstances. What is the maximum bonus? height bonus that would be permitted. Is there a cap? Um, Aska, do you wanna go first and then I'll add to it? Um, yes, yeah. so for, so the, the height is, so the, the height is 25%, uh, but there is, there is a cap on when uh, 10 feet for the, so there's two different type, like um, height uh, being- uh, Are you in R10 the way, a lot of Broadway is. Yeah. So for the easement itself, the height is capped at ten uh, at ten feet, um, or it's twenty or it's twenty feet if the easement being provided is above grade, because that takes up more of the space within the building and, um, envelope. Um, but for most of the the most of the easements that would be applicable in Manhattan, it would not be an above grade easement. So the cap would be the ten feet. Um, and then with the bonus, um, th uh, with the bonus provision, that is where the twenty-five percent of the height increase is uh, is uh, uh, you know included in with the with the with up to twenty percent of bonus. Uh, when but it's hard for me to say a cap. Uh, Chris can clarify a cap beyond that when it comes to a special permit because it's on such a case by case basis that those uh, applications are reviewed and it really depends on the building proposal and, um, you know, what is included. Okay, what would the authorization be for then? Um, I, I, I can clarify this. Um, so we have two separate authorizations. One authorization is just for a floor area increase up to 20%, and that really depends on the transit improvements that are being provided and the public benefits that, that would be generated from these transit improvements. Um, this authorization for a floor area increase will not in and of itself give additional height. A developer can go through the floor area uh, authorization by providing a transit improvement without any sort of height increase on their site. If they do want height increase, um, they will have, they have two options. They will have to go through a separate authorization process. That authorization process would allow for additional modifications, which would include a height increase of up to 25%. And if they want more than 25% of a height increase or other zoning modifications, they will have to go through a special permit process, which will be subject to ULERP. Um, all of these modifications are subject to city um, city planning commission findings. Well, of course, uh, yeah. but the authorization is not subject to your re review at all. It's not. Um, it, it's it's a discretionary action, and so it, it would not come to a community board. Is what it I mean. It would be referred out to a community board. Okay. Yeah. One other question before Ethel, who I know must have a long list. No. <laughs> no. Uh, all. All of these increases, they're folded into each other. They're not on top of each other. Am I correct? They must be folded in. So if you have a 20% increase and then you're going for the 25, you would only be able to get that additional 5%. It's or are not you talking 20 and then 25? Uh, sorry, can you clarify? Um, I, I think that, like, uh, just to clarify, floor area is would be very different than a height increase. So the twenty percent, up to twenty percent of a floor area, could, uh, if you're increasing twenty percent of a floor area on your building, that could re ask, require you that you have height increases as a result of that. So and that that's yes. where the twenty that's where the twenty five percent. Height, so that twenty five percent is related to building height. It's not building off of the twenty percent of floor area. That's related to the building height and not the floor area. Um, if, does that clarify? If I understood what you were saying correctly? Yes, floor area can also be height. Okay, you're referring more to bulk. 
Floor floor area is separate from height. Yes, I do. Thank you. I, am uh, I next? Okay, F Ethel, uh, Ethel and then Shima. No, I said, am I next to? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I Shima ask, was are next. We gonna but, get, uh, are we going to get this presentation so that we can look at it again? Um, yeah, we can share this. Um, Nabil can share it. Thank you. Just send us send us the slide deck, and we'll I'll circulate it. Yep, I'll do that, Richard. Okay. Ethel, do you mind if I go next? If I have a hate question. Yes, I. I All right, go ahead, Seema. Go ahead. Let's, oh, I'm sorry. All right. Um, just because I have a hate question as well. Yeah. So my my question is: We have a stretch of Broadway that has you know contextual zoning with a height limit. So were any of those properties along that stretch to apply for the density bonus? Does that just sort of obviate that height limit and they get 20% above? How, how does that interact with the height limit, I guess, is my question. It, it, so we have the easement provisions, uh, 10, 10 feet in, in your community. Um, the 10 feet would add on to the, uh, the height limit. And if they are a site that is providing a transit improvement, um, any additional height will have to go through an authorization process. It, meaning and, and could, that, could, that could increase, um, that could exceed the, um, the building height, but it would be subject to an authorization. An authorization is not subject to full ULERP. The, the special permit would be though. Okay, got it. So basically though, it does um, that, height limit will be sort of not respected if any of these the right that's in. why we decided to make it into a discretionary review process um through an authorization or a special permit process got it and one one related question is do you have any sense of like how quickly the accessibility issues will be addressed through these programs through this text amendment um, it's difficult to say, like, I think a, uh, a timeline. Uh, the hope is that by expanding the system wide, um, you know, that that we're it, the system wide for the transit easement portion, at least that, you know, that allows MTA to actually, you know, um, have accessibility in a, lot, in a lot of the stations that currently it's not possible to do that, you know, especially like looking beyond uh, Manhattan, there are other boroughs where there's a lot of a lot of the subway lines are elevated mm -hmm. and, and the site conditions around them, uh, you know, a lot of times they're right next to a building that doesn't allow us to put an elevator there, even if MTA wants to. So that easement, um, you know, provision would allow that any new development or enlargements that are happening next to those lines would have to come to the MTA. And, you know, and if there's an easement requirement, they will have to provide and that it's a lot uh the possibility of getting an elevator there is a lot more once the FA is approved. Thank you. Ethel. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, I thought the many of the questions I, I was about to ask, including very much those that Louisa was asking. Um, I, I, I'm going to just for a minute be very provincial and parochial. And um, of course, we're all interested in all of these uh, possibilities because we all travel throughout the city. But if we look at Community Board 7, uh, which um, is almost completely, though there are uh, certain exceptions, built uh, up. It is already built up with not that many opportunities, although anything can occur for new development um, because there are some sites and most notably uh, perhaps um, if things change at 110th street and and some other places my question is um, and it's hard to understand to what extent can the accessibility improvements and other design improvements which you alluded to which are also accessibility such as um, changing or uh, um, sidewalks, promoting a different design of sidewalks, which may be helpful if one is even dealing with surface transportation, such as getting on a bus and so on. To what extent 
uh, those kinds of improvements, which might in the short run, by which I could say 15 or 20 years, be very applicable in board seven. My assumption being that, that we can't predict, but that there may not be, you know, six or eight new sites, new, uh, new construction or 10, but that there's a lot of need for improving accessibility. To what extent can there be, uh, how would it happen? To what extent, for example, could the community board and with your specialist be analyzing those kinds of improvements which could make a big difference and which are not the ones that lead to uh, demolition, height changes, FAR, and so on considerations. Um, that's a very good question. Um, and, yes. you know, um, uh, uh, MT, I'll let, Vincent, I'll let you talk to more about the immediate concerns. But I think one thing else I wanted to highlight, though, is while the, that for that reason, you know, we have in our easement provisions that we're proposing that even for conversions, so buildings that are existing, um, if there's a conversion happening, they could, that could be something that triggers a voluntary, you know, um, uh, uh, easement requirement, not requirement, but it could be, an, they could get that, uh, that, that provision could be used for them to provide an easement on their site voluntarily in return for some zoning relief. Um, you know, that, and that was consciously made with that idea that a lot is, uh, you know, there's a lot of sites that are already built. There's a lot of buildings that are already built. Right. Um, and, you know, we can't make a requirement for them to come back to us, but, you know, for any future changes and enlargements and, you know, conversions, uh, um, we definitely thought about that. Um, so, and, so that, I'm sorry. Go I, ahead. I didn't mean, okay. Uh, I, it, again, with uh, us being able to study uh, the slides uh, and to have that uh, for a while, maybe we could set up a little group here to be looking at some of the, these uh, points and timing and feasibility uh, for us to be studying and making recommendations of, of some practical work that could be feasible along with the others that you have described that involve considerable development, uh, which w may not be occurring uh, for another 20 years, but the other would be very valuable to be working on together with you. Thank you. I, uh, I have uh, a few questions. <laughs> Um, Richard, can I just yeah. add one no, thing sure, to go ahead. Ethel? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you shouldn't be left with the impression that this zoning bonus provision, uh, this text change, is the only way that we're going to get accessible stations. Right, now that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Now <laughs> that congestion pricing is coming, yeah. um, which is going to give $11 billion uh, a year towards the $55 billion MTA capital program, which has hundreds of station accessible projects in it, you can expect that that will also help pay for accessible stations. Because yes, certainly along Central Park West, we don't have any developable sites. It, it doesn't exactly. appear and Broadway exactly. is limited. Right, so that's a very good thing to know and talk about planning. Uh, this is something that really the community board uh, could undertake, you know, transportation layers. This is this is a very practical and maybe even feasible thing to do that could improve things considerably. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a few questions. I'll just I'll list them and then you can answer them in, in order if you don't mind. Number one, there are other provisions in the zoning resolution which grant bonuses, such as. Uh, affordable housing bonuses. Would a bonus of 25% be available to a site which has an additional bonus such as affordable housing? Um, okay, so to, again, to clarify, the bonus is only 20% and there well, are- But there's other... a discretionary, uh, I, I, it can go higher. Um, no, the bonus can't go higher than 20%. That's for okay. height relief. So the height relief okay. is up to 25%, Understood. but the bonus right. is capped at 20%. Right. Gotcha. Um, and there are other uh, bonus, you know, programs that zoning has, uh, you know, the, and it's 
this bonus provision, this transit bonus cannot be stacked with any other bonus uh, programs except for one, which is the voluntary housing um, bonus of 20%. And that was something we decided to do because we did not want accessibility and affordable housing to compete each other with each other. So if at a, at a site, a developer would like to provide, like we didn't have to make a choice of between accessibility and affordability basically uh, in that sense. So this, that's the only bo bonus that could be combined, but no other bonuses uh, can be combined and they will still have to pick one or the other. And, and not uh, if there's a mandatory bonus, uh, Ma mandatory housing inclusion. bonus that cannot be combined with an accessibility bonus. Uh, yeah, mandatory inclusionary housing doesn't have a bonus component. That's just a requirement, uh, only voluntarily. Uh, I just, um, well, it, it's a bonus in the sense that it's, it's, it, 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 it well, the increases the height and size of the building. But this, this is available in mandatory inclusionary housing zones? Yeah, okay. but, but Richard, the yeah. voluntary, just what was said, yeah. Voluntary inclusionary could has which does exist in, in several areas in board seven that I'm, I'm following up on what was just said there the if the developer opts for the voluntary that does that does not preclude right a, a, a transit bonus and so that you can have be, a you can have a 40 percent because that does exist exactly already. yeah you can have a 40 percent bonus um, no, no. The, it, it, another uh, question I have is, um, is you know, for, for uh, the uh, inclusionary uh, housing bonus, there are uh, basically dollar numbers attached to the uh, privilege of building an additional 20%. Are there any criteria, guidelines, dollars, how much a developer would have to contribute to station uh, development in order to get a bonus? So, uh, do you want to? Oh, go ahead. I'll, 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 I'll take that. Sure. Um, so the developer doesn't contribute the dollars. They, they, they make, they build the capital improvement. They build the elevator in exchange for the zoning bonus. Um, and, and obviously it's not a, a, a dollar for the improvement, um, but we do have a general sense of of what the improvement would cost and 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 how that corresponds with the size of the zoning bonus which would be only up to 20 percent but there's nothing in the proposed uh, zoning text amendment that would uh, in any way uh, affect your discretion in that regard. could you clarify the question yeah i mean I, it's uh Maybe, Richard, it's, are yeah. there any dollars attached to what significant improvement means? Yeah. Well, we, so is this a negotiation with the developer or is it something that you can impose on the developer? And do you have any guidelines or criteria as to how much a 20% zoning bonus is worth? We have a general process. Um, the developer certainly has to put together when they when they put together their plan, their scope of improvements. Um, it's always useful for them to also put together a cost estimate to help guide the discussions. But it's it's certainly it's it's really a negotiation between you and the developer. It's not and, nothing in the zoning resolution that that uh, as well sets as the, the price and and the CPC. Yeah. It, it's, okay. Um, Sorry, I, I just yeah, wanted... if, if, uh, my next, let me, if I can, my next question, um, and I'm almost finished with my questions. Uh, the, uh, there is discretion to uh, increase height, but suppose you have a site where an alternative would be to increase lot coverage instead of height. Is it the developer's choice or does city planning have um, and the community board have a role in deciding whether the, 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 the compensatory FAR should be on top of the building or on the side. I can answer that question. Um, so for the easement itself, um, it, it's not through just 
discretionary review and approval. So if you are providing an easement volume on your zoning lot, then you get um, additional relief. That can mean 10 to 20 feet of additional height, 10 feet in your community board or community district. Um, we also looked at law coverage um, in, in certain uh, districts where um, you may, instead of increasing height, want um, to locate some of your local retail within the rear yard up to a certain height. So we're, we, we do have those type of relief where instead of increasing height, we are providing options for sites that are providing easement where they would want to locate their commercial uses within the, um, within the first two or three floors up to a height of 30 feet. But it's the developer's choice as to whether to expand upward or. That's for the easement provisions. So that's that's right. separate from the transit improvement. I understand. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I understand. Right. And and now, right. and but, now, but that is all you're talking about. It's either height, or you're talking about more flexibility about where retail can be located. Right. You're not talking about instead of the height putting the floor area in some other place on the zoning lot that's that's the idea for the easement relief you know for for sites that are subject to this requirement where they, they have to provide an easement volume not not constructing the improvement itself but just providing easement volume for the mta we are allowing for all these type of relief that you know gives them the flexibility to you know instead of increasing height they may want to locate their commercial floor space up to a certain height within the rear instead of on top. Okay. Um, as for the transit improvements, which are subject to discretionary review, again, the floor area bonus is just the floor area bonus authorization. We are not, if, if a developer goes through the authorization for floor area bonus, it, it's, it's not an automatic that they would get a 25% height increase. The 25% height increase in other, you know, zoning modifications, that would be um, subject to another type of action, another authorization, and um, that application will, in, in any case, the floor area bonus and additional discretionary uh, uh, modifications to zoning will have to go, th will be referred out to the community board. I, th that unfortunately reminds me of my final question. <laughs> um, the, uh, the you mentioned that there's, there's a special permit is available uh, where uh, required, uh, and usually where there are special permits, there are required findings. Are there required findings in this resolution? There are required findings for the authorizations uh, for the authorization for the floor area bonus, and and uh, I wanted to just kind of clarify that in the zoning text, we will have specific findings to determine. Um, um, the commission will have to find that the transit improvement is significant. And a lot of that depends on how much um, public benefit will derive from that transit improvement. Because I, well, I didn't see the findings in the slide deck. So if they're in writing, I wonder if you could send that to us. We, we, we have another version that has um, a list of the findings for the floor okay. area. Um, All right, I'll um, shut up now. Anyone else? And, and, and well, sorry. I have some questions, but we do want to try to wrap this up uh, soon because we have a whole nother presentation. Um, but so so a couple questions. Um, since when the, if a developer has a, uh, develops this part of the subway station in exchange for floor area and or height, um, is it still considered a taking where the city or the state is also paying the developer because they're taking space away or is that now null and, and, and they're building the same size building they would if there was no subway station? Is, is your question in regards to the, the easement requirement? Yes. No, we, that's, we, this, that is not a taking. Um, in, in return for giving the MTA the easement for future station access, the developer would be getting uh, a, a package of zoning relief measures. And that would include that the zoning floor area not being counted, that the, the space, the, the volume of the, the easement above grade, as well as um, 
well, my, my planning colleagues could chime in um, on the package of zoning relief measures. So the, the, the MTA won't be paying for lease, the easement, lease of the space. The, the space though remains in the, the private sector's hands and who, and who maintains it? So, so until such time that the MTA is ready to come in and build out the improvement, the, de the, the developer, the owner of the building in which the easement is located, they can use that easement. They can occupy that easement. For example, even along um, the Second Avenue corridor, we actually do have easements under this uh, special transit land use district. And uh, owners of those buildings in which the easement is located, they actually have functioning commercial spaces. And so those are allowed uses temporary uses until such time when the MTA is, is ready to come in and build out the, the access point, hopefully um, such as an elevator. And, and if the, the developer builds the transit improvements, then what happens? Oh, under the bonus provision? Yes. Well, if, if they're adjacent to the station, then, then we would have an easement as within their building because it's an easement entrance going down to the station. If, it, if they are an offsite developer because they're within that 500 foot radius of a station, then the improvement would be outside of their building. It could be um, a sidewalk elevator going down to the mezzanine, or it could help us complete station accessibility. It could be uh, an elevator or elevators going down between the mezzanine to the platform level. And, and the MTA always maintains everything after the inhale. So, so that's a good question. And so I will um, break down the, the different uh, types of maintenance. If, it's, if we get an easement, then the MTA would be building out the improvement, building out the elevator. So the MTA would be responsible for maintenance and a capital replacement. If the, let's just say it's an elevator, it's an offsite elevator, it's not within the developer's building because the developer's not adjacent to our station, the developer will build it, but they wouldn't maintain it because it's not in their building. However, they would pay the MTA a maintenance buyout, as well as the maintenance, the buyout would also include a capital replacement. And capital replacement of elevators is typically somewhere between years 15 and 20, de depending on the amount of usage. Now, if the elevator is built by a developer and they're adjacent to the station, so the, the entrance, let's say, is, is within their building, they would be responsible for maintaining that elevator and doing a capital replacement. And all of the requirements are clearly laid out in the transit improvement agreement that the MTA executes with a developer. And I'm not, I'm not sure uh, if you made this clear, but if the MTA, you said that in addition to maybe there's stairs or, or elevator or uh, subway, but in some aspects, there also might be some commercial space like retail, adjacent retail. Um, I guess, how do you avoid not giving a developer a bonus for providing a commercial space that they could have provided if, even if there was no subway improvement? Or is the space for the retail only if the MTA is building out that space? Um, could you clarify, because I, I, if you're, are you talking about the easement provision? Because that yeah. is like, if there's an easement, you know, there, we are uh, permitting, you know, certain retail uses um, that would uh, to be adjacent to those uh, easements because, you know, to activate that space, um, especially if an, an, an improvement is going in there, but there's no bonus that is associated with that. So an easement doesn't have anything. They uh, An easement only has only relief to accommodate the easement volume. So in that case, the the developer 
the MTA would acquire the easement for, say, stairs and a small retail shop or something for accessibility? Or no, they're just the MTA used to have it adjacent to the MTAs? I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, I, I think uh, we're, oh, uh, Louisa. Okay, George and, I have a and Andrew. <laughs> and, okay. By the way, I, I think, I mean, I, Jeanette, tell me if you disagree. I, I, we have until June 14th, so I wouldn't propose to craft any resolution tonight. I want to look at the oh, deck. Hmm? Yes. Right. All right. Uh, Louisa, okay. Doug, and Andrew. Yes. George put the uh, findings on the chat. Number three yeah. was for improvements involving environmental design that measures to augment station beautification walkability or environmental noise or air quality will constitute significant enhancements to the station environment. I was under the impression that we were talking about elevated accessibility, which is really important and essential to, to spread throughout the, the system. Um, this is talking about station beautification, basically. Um, how can that be justified? I, I can answer that question. So okay. um, accessibility will always be a priority, I think, for the MTA. Um, if, if a station is not accessible, I believe that will be probably the first thing that they're going to look at as an improvement. Improvements, though, however, in certain cases where a station is fully accessible, um, there may be other types of improvements that we would like to allow through this bonus authorization. But where a station is not accessible, you know, uh, accessibility improvements will be the key thing. Well, I understand that. I was just wondering why this very generous bonus would be extended to what would be basically beautification of a station, of which once they have been beautified are wonderful, but perhaps are not deserving of mm -hmm. this greater bonus. So these, um, so sorry, um, just ahead. No, very, ahead, very quickly before, before I hand it off to you. Um, the, so these findings are really based on what we currently have. It, it's, it's an updated version of what we currently have under the current subway bonus mechanism. And this current subway bonus mechanism looks at a whole suite of different types of improvements. So, you know, this is just a more up, updated version of but it was limited to commercial districts correct it was yeah that's and that's why residential areas present a whole different set of problems mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we we i mean through the zoning for accessibility we've updated it to um uh to to uh to apply to other other types of districts as well beyond 10 far commercial districts uh doug and then andrew Doug? Yes, real, yep. real quick. Uh, a real quick question and then just a, just a, a summary. The Doug, question, could you get a little closer to the mic? Yes, I'm sorry. Can you hear me okay now? Not really. No? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so the on the retail provision, and some people know why I'm asking this question, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the until the MTA uses that area for retail, it can be used... For, I'm, I'm sorry, until the MTA uses the easement for the purpose of accessibility, et cetera, that space can be used for retail until such time the MTA w claims it. Is that what we're saying? Or is it? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So that obviously does create some complications because if someone's going to build out a store or whatever, there has to, you know, there's a time they can, there could be a, a, a moment in time where their lease is canceled. So that creates just a, a challenge. But what I wanted to say is just sort of back of the napkin, Math, uh, math, I was just going through my sort of mental Rolodex of thinking, okay, West 79th Street and Broadway. This is like a real life, real time example in our district. West 79th Street and Broadway, the DSW space that's owned by Zabars, it has, it's, an, it's an FAR of 10, currently as built 3.4, right? So if the current owner were to develop it without any additional bonus, it's a, allowable as 102,000, 103,000 square feet. If they utilize the easement, because 79th Street, if, if I remember, is absolutely in need of accessibility, it is a very tight station, then the developer could add 
on top of that, bringing 123,000. If they do the voluntary in, uh, affordable housing, then they're going up to 40%. Now they're at 143, 144,000. And we haven't even talked about height yet. So that's kind of a real example in our district. Do I have that right? Are you talking about the, um, the R10 program on that site? Like for inclusionary housing? Well, if, if it, the, my understanding oh. is that it is both and. It's not, it, in other words, it is possible for a developer to choose the voluntary um, affordable housing, get their 20% bonus, additionally do the easement, get their another 20% bonus, right? It's not compounded, I assume. Not, it's not the easement, the transit improvement, yes. Transit improvement, I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry. It, it, can, it can stack, yes. It can stack, so, you, so that developer conservatively, if they do both, can add 40% bonus to their existing FAR. That's yes. right. Okay, thanks, I understand. So uh, so I would like to suggest that we, did, we sort of move on to the next presentation um, and we'll continue to discuss the uh, this once we will share the deck of slides so that everybody can take a closer look. And then if people can submit their comments, we'll try to consolidate them and share it around. I have a very just, uh, quick Andrew question. Andrew had his hand up, so let's, let's hear from Andrew. Yeah, very quick. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, on the cover of your very first slide, you had a fabulous map showing every subway, commuter rail, and Staten Island Railway station in the five boroughs. You, you also mentioned that you're looking for approval from all 59 community boards. Does this program also apply to a commuter rail station such as Queens Village or, or Laurelton if there's a development there? Yeah, so this is a system-wide, um, the easement program is system-wide. So anywhere in the five boroughs that has a commuter rail or a subway station or a Staten Island rail station, is that correct? Yeah. Thank you, that was my question. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So everybody. we'll uh, we'll have a, a lengthy and spirited discussion next month and leading to a resolution uh, and present it to the June uh, full board, which would be in within the time limit we have. Um, I wonder whether either Christopher or uh, uh, someone from uh, city planning might want to sit in on our uh, May meeting if we have any technical questions but we can arrange that offline. But thanks very much for coming all of you. Very, it was very informative. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Rich, it's June 1st, our, our full board meeting in June is June 1st. Yeah, well, so if we have a May, uh, May committee meeting leading to resolution and then a full board resolution in early June, well, we have until well, June 14th, so. Richard, since we, we seem to just have a jam-packed land use calendar every single month. I'm going to suggest that once we pass around the slides that committee members submit their comments to us and we try to consolidate them so it's not that lengthy the next meeting. But yeah, with that, fine. let's move on to our next item, which is a presentation by George James from Landmark West. On the Can I just ask a really quick question? Who is this? Speaking? Can I just ask a really quick question, which is, is our approval binary? Is it a yes, no, or no. can we? No, we can make suggestions. We okay. can. We can say we like this, but we don't like that. Or we yeah. think 20% is too low. It should be 90%. Okay. All right. That's all I've got. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, George, and, and I guess Sean is here. Hi, I'm here. I'll be very quick. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, Landmark West has been working on this with George for uh, maybe 18 months. And George is definitely, uh, he's a consultant to Landmark West. Uh, we like to think he works for us, but he is his own uh, independent body at George James Associates. And uh, we thank him for preparing this for us. This is in the spirit of uh, transparency and collaboration. We're sharing this. Uh, this is something that we've submitted to DCP. And we're hoping uh, it's in the, the best interest for the neighborhood. We believe it is. And what we're here today is asking if uh, CB7 would consider being a co-applicant on the application. Uh, that's the takeaway. So with that, I will be quiet. And thank you, George. 
Great. Uh, thanks, Sean. All right. So, <clears throat> all right. So this is all about this site in red, um, the ABC site. So ABC owned 2.6 acres in a C47 district just outside the Lincoln Square Special District. It's most of this block between Central Park West, Columbus, 66th, and 67th Street. Now, ABC is moving. They've announced those plans. They have a site downtown that they're moving to. Um, and they sold the site to a developer in 2018 with a, well, reportedly a five-year leaseback agreement. So ABC hasn't vacated the site yet. They're planning to. They're building their new site, but they're still here um, and will be for the next couple of years at least. Um, now, the C47 underlying zoning, and it covers the, nearly this entire block, um, is, uh, allows for standard towers in the mid block and up to 12 FAR. Um, so, ABC, you know, they've been on this site a long time. You know, you think about the history of television. They, they actually occupied this site uh, as early as 1948, at least part of this block. This is from the 1955 Bromley map. And the, um, the special Lincoln Square District, uh, when it was first set up in 1969 and then amended in 1993, it purposely omitted this block, right? It, it's, it's very conspicuous that it's absent um, because it's the only C47 in the air, in, you know, nearby anyway, um, that uh, is not in uh, the special district. And there's a good reason for that, right? Because ABC it has a corporate campus here, it has, it's building studios, it's doing a lot of things that uh, require flexibility to build out the campus as they built out this block over most of the 20th century. And this flexibility though, and, it, and the C47 zoning, you know, it allows buildings like this, right? These are, these are what we call standard towers in zoning. Um, and what does that mean, standard towers? Um, standard towers are buildings that break the sky exposure plane, but they cover no more than 40% of their zoning lot. Now, 30 years ago, in response to towers getting narrower and narrower and narrower and taller and taller and taller, because of course standard towers have no height limit, um, there were there were regulations that were adopted to essentially not only have a maximum tower coverage, but to have a minimum tower coverage. Um, and that's not everywhere, but it is in the the special Lincoln Square District, which was adopted in 1993. Now, special Lincoln Square District, it doesn't allow standard towers, but it still allows towers. It allows this, this, this form called a tower on base. And essentially, this is uh, six, 1965 Broadway. 60% um, of the floor area must be 100, under 150 feet. The tower portion must cover between no less than 30, no more than 40% of the lot, um, must have a base at or near the street line uh, for better urban design. The idea was is that you know, standard towers, you know, have these open space and plazas, that it was not good for a district like this to have wanted a consistent street wall at, at or near the street line. Um, it typically produces uh, buildings that are about 30 stories tall, 32 stories tall, something in that range. Um, and so what does this all mean like for the ABC site in terms of the application? Um, so this is existing condition. Uh, the, the ABC properties, the ones that will be available are colored here. Um, the ones furthest to the east are landmarked. Um, the others are not. And so if the spe special Lincoln Square District regulations applied to this block, um, buildings would be of this kind of familiar height, you know, maybe around 400 feet or so. Um, th we did these at 33 stories, 400 feet, um, and which is similar to the buildings around it. It's going to be a little shorter than Millennium Tower over here, which inspired these regulations, um, but it's going to be similar to some of the other towers around it. That's what the, um, the, the application would promote. So under current zoning, standard towers here, you know, they have no height limit. The, the site is gigantic. Um, and so you don't have the same sort of limitations, right? The only thing is, is that, is that the towers can't cover more than 40% of the lot. And so what we've been seeing are very tall, and you've seen these in, in Midtown especially, um, very tall 
um, towers along this line. These were modeled after um, Central Park Tower and uh, 432 Park Avenue. Um, and essentially, you know, these, these buildings could be taller and they're limited right now mostly by engineering. We're just not seeing buildings taller than this, but these are as tall as, as some of the tallest residential buildings uh, in Manhattan. And, you know, we have a couple of views that we, we stuck the uh, uh, 36 West 66th Street building in here as it was originally proposed, just for context, the Millennium Tower is over here. Um, this is a view from Central Park. This is a view from Damrush Park. Um, they're very tall, right? There's just no, no doubt about it. It's very tall. And, you know, you, you, we see these buildings in Midtown. We don't see them on the Upper East and Upper West Side. And part of it is, is, is because we don't have full block or near full block tower districts. Um, normally the tower portion of a zoning district only fronts the first 100 feet of an avenue. And the big zoning lot means you can get a big tower. Okay, so Landmark West, as Sean has said, it started um, an application for a zoning map and text amendment to expand the special Lincoln Square District to what I call the ABC block. And essentially the basic planning rationale is in 1993, amendment, the 1993 amendments to the special Lincoln Square District, they were successful. Um, they facilitated new development with a desirable, predictable tower form. The ABC block was left out of the Special Lincoln Square District to give the campus more flexibility. And, you know, as a planner, I understand that. I think that was a reasonable thing to do. Um, as ABC is vacating, the current C47 zoning can produce an unpredictable building form, which is inconsistent with the neighborhood. And so, therefore, rezoning is warranted. And Honestly, this is going to be one of the, I mean, whenever you try to do zo change zoning, it's a big deal, but the action is entirely moving this boundary up to here and making this part of subdistrict C, not subdistrict A. So, so the, the reason for that is that subdistrict A in the special district has a limitation on the amount of commercial space on the zoning lot. You, you didn't have that limitation down here closer to Midtown. As you got further away from Midtown, there were limitations on commercial. You know, this entire site is, or most of this entire site is commercial. So we didn't think that that limitation was necessary. Okay, so where we are in the process, the pre the pre uh, land use process has already been started. Um, Landmark West has completed the pre-application meetings with BCP, um, pre-application statement, we did a draft of the reasonable worst case development scenario. Uh, DCP got their comments back to us. We have revised um, the reasonable worst case development scenario. And just today, Nabila and I were talking about how to re um, submit this digitally in their new digital submission system that they implemented last month. Um, I still got to figure that out, but it's done. Um, the uh, uh, DCP is, you know, so these are the remaining steps and there's still a lot. <laughs> there's, there are many steps to take. So DCP has to uh, review the revised reasonable worst case development scenario um, and then get back comments back to us that if, if they have any. Um, then we have to complete the ULERP application and that will take a, that will take a while, the land use form, the environmental assessment, um, and then uh, uh, DCP certification. Um, and then once it's been certified, it starts ULERP. Um, and that's a more familiar process for you all, I'm quite sure. Now, there are points of failure, right? You know, we can go through this entire process and we get to the CPC hearing or the vote from CPC. And if they vote no, it's over, right? It doesn't go for further. Um, and if it gets by the CPC and the city council member doesn't like it, and no vote's going to kill it here. So, you know, it's a lot to invest for, for a no vote. Uh, but, you know, we've had encouraging signs. And Nabila's here and she can tell me, she can uh, say if I'm wrong. But I, uh, I was happy that DCP did not discourage the application. Um, you know, in, in these things, you don't want to in your pre-application uh, meeting with BCP, um, get a lot of concerns, right? You know, concerns about the appropriateness or the planning rationale. We didn't get that. Um, 
we, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't discourage it, which was to me positive. Um, Helen Rosenthal has been positive. Um, Gail Brewer has been positive. Um, I gotta say, I do have some concerns um, about the CPC. I don't, I don't know how that would go once this is done. I think we have a great planning rationale. I think it's great. Um, and in fact, maybe one of the most solid planning rationales in a rezoning. But I'm gonna say is that, that some, some councilmen or some uh, commissioners, um, you know, might be sympathetic if the property owner objects um, because, you know, property, it, it is his property. Um, but, you know, I will also say that the site is unique, right? There is no other site that would, has this kind of circumstance where it was left out of a, re, a rezoning um, for flexibility that it no longer needs. And so it has no broader impacts. It's really just about this site. And the action, we have to remind ourselves, it's not a down zoning. You get to, they get to keep every square footage of zoning they have. It's not a contextual zoning. Um, unlimited height towers are still permitted. It's just the form of those towers. And if they are standard towers or tower in the base. Um, and so, you know, we're in front of you today, as Sean said, to, to see if uh, the, the um, community board wants to be a co-applicant. Um, and, and essentially, this is my recommendation um, to, to Landmark West. I, um, I think that private applications benefit from agency co-applicants. Um, and, you know, does the community board have an interest in joining as a co-applicant? Essentially, you'd be named as a co-applicant. And I think the idea would be to, to have you as a real co-applicant, meaning um, review the application. You would read the application to um, be involved in discussions with DCP, um, to be a conduit to the public, right? Because you have a special role in um, engaging with the public. I, at least that's my vision. Sean may actually, we didn't discuss these uh, before the meeting, but <laughs> um, that would be my vision or you know, other roles that the community board would like to play if they want to be a co-applicant. Um, and if they don't, I think the application is still going to continue forward. Um, but uh, it's something that I think um, I think uh, Landmark West would like you to consider. I know I would like you to consider it as well. And, and just George, have you had any discussions with the owner? Oh, with the I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had any, Sean. Do you want to take that? We, everything is pending getting this application in, which is imminent. So we expect to reach out momentarily. All right. So we don't know if the current owner would reject or not to the proposal. Correct. You know, we're not doing this to be evil or mean. We're doing this in the best interest, we right. believe, of the Upper West Side. But Right. And, and um, just to be clear, is that uh, an applicant, does, you can do a rezoning without the applicant's permission, right? That, that is, if applicant's permission is not required for rezoning. I understand. Okay. All right. Um, I, I don't know exactly how to proceed. I, oh, uh, Paige. Well, yeah, let's open it to questions. Uh, just very briefly, first of all, thank you for letting us bring this to you. Um, and um, it's not that we've been hiding it under a bushel. Um, the, the immediate uh, buildings around um, our office, which is on um, 67th Street, are aware that we have been doing this deep dive. George has been talking to us for at least 18 months on how to approach this. And our reason for coming to you now um, and this is me as I'm wearing half a hat of chair of Landmark West, but and also being an architect is that George is right. Um, when you see these actions take place, the more community involvement and opinion that you can generate um, helps our action and actually keeps the community informed. Um, this is not something um, that we, we, we we want to do on our own. This is a huge um, undertaking. Um, there was another parcel of this, which many of you probably know, which was a TV studio on West End Avenue. Um, that was also sold as part of this parcel, but that doesn't have the ramifications of changing the skyline. And potentially we, we've been talking to people, friends of Central Park and a, a ton of other uh, residents um, around our office. And we thought 
with Steve. Um, we shared some of this. We thought it's time that we bring it to the community so we can share it with everyone. So um, it's not that we were holding it back. It's just now the time is right, given the time frame that George has laid out. Sean, have I left anything out? Oh, I, we're gonna uh, Peter, then Ethel, then Roberta. Yeah. Um, I think this is a uh, uh, a huge and um, horrendous proposal. I think the um, Many of us have seen uh, the sites south of Central Park be built up and how that skyline um, has changed in the last 10 years. But different from uh, those sites along 57th, 58th and 59th Street, those sites are, are um, south of Central Park and the sun is very high um, usually when it hits the park there. But um, this particular site C is west of the park and the shadow um, in the afternoon would be huge. Uh, we've seen shadow studies, uh, I've seen them, and they would go halfway across, if not all the way across the park in some of the most sensitive uh, portions of Central Park. I think it's a dangerous, dangerous um, project and, and uh, one that the community board should um, step up to and, and s soundly um, disapprove and let the city know. Um, I think it would be um, devastating um, to most of Central Park. Peter, just to clarify, they're saying as of right, you could build the towers. And so within the uh, special district, you wouldn't be able to build the towers. It's not so really a disapproval. It's joining the application for a zoning text. Amendment. Right, so, so to be clear, a lot of things come to you when there's a project proposed. This project here is not proposed, right? This is just <laughs> something that could be done under current zoning, right? Right. If somebody wants to build this today, they can. And the idea was to change the zoning so that they would could do something like this. Again, it's just as big. It's got just as much floor area, but lower, just, a lot lower. Yeah. But it's and it's, it's still a tower, right? I mean, these are not small buildings. They're four hundred foot, four hundred feet tall, right? They're big. They're just not as tall as this, right? And and it's a whole idea of where super talls are appropriate. Some, some people may say nowhere, but you know, they're certainly more appropriate in Midtown than they are on the Upper West Side. Okay. Um, I've forgotten whether Ethel or Roberta is going yeah. first. I think Roberta is. Okay. Oh, okay. Oops. Hi, so um, when I was chair of the board in 2018, 19, we hired George James to do a study for us on, on sunlight. And uh, in, in that study, we discovered that more, more buildings, if, if, if um, it went through as, as planned without changing the um, zoning, that more buildings on the Upper West Side from I think 72nd Street all the way down to 63rd or 64th Street, George, correct me if I'm wrong, would lose light and air and Central Park would have permanent um, areas where there would be no sunlight, there would be no, um, there would be, it would just be a disaster. And so um, I, I'm glad to share again with the committee on this, but it, it's just so important that we join this this application because it's little buildings that are five stories high that have areas of, of light within the, the back of their building would suddenly be without light for much most of the day. So it's not just 
it's not just the the losing sun in Central Park. It's also uh, buildings from 72nd, 73rd Street, all the way down to 63rd Street that would be infected. Thank you. Ethel? Yes. And, uh, and Melissa? Yes, I, I have a, a series of, um, of questions, which I think are uh, short uh, in terms of answers, but I think important. Um, uh, as uh, as uh, you said, um, George, um, this is what can be done yeah. now. We do not have a proposal. We are, I'm just, I'm just saying that I'm gonna just get the line of this because they will be connected. Mm -hmm. And we understand that ABC will be relinquishing its title in approximately two years. And we do we know at all whether they have made any deal with any buyer or any prospective buyer for that site because they are not keeping it. Uh, they, they, were, they had five years and it's coming up in two years. So do we know, what's the answer to that question? Sean, do you want to take that? It, it, the site was purchased by Silverstein Properties, so they right. have so they're on the sale lease back. And ABC. Right, so that we know that there is so that it's Silverstein, and that we know there's an actual buyer, and hence it is to be assumed an actual proposal at some point yeah, that all they've could published. go along, along the lines of what could be done as outlined by George and as permitted in the zoning. Is that a fair summary to the extent we know it? All we know from the published accounts are that there will be potentially multiple towers. That okay, oh, I didn't realize. Okay, so we're talking about multiple towers, you, we think, or is it one? That was what was in the press. Okay, okay, because the image has always been the, the larger one, but okay, fine. Um, if the board were to uh, join um, with Landmark West, and certainly uh, in general, it is, it is more effective and often better community planning if the community, if a, the community board could be uh, uh, an important principal uh, requester of uh, the, uh, the zoning proposal as described by George. But if that were to happen, here are some mundane questions. Uh, would uh, the costs of this, for example, such as paying George? This is beautiful. Most importantly, I need a reduction shot. Oh, yeah, did I finish, excuse me, did I finish the sentence? I'm sorry. Am I, did I finish what I. I, I think I, it was background noise, Ethel. Go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought so. I've been maybe. Ethel, come on, let's. Uh, get, I'm doing get it. I'm getting there. I got so right. distracted by a voice asking me a question that I didn't ask. Um, uh, may I ask? Would would it be necessary and even essential for the community board uh, to be sharing in the cost for paying the consultant and any other costs that are necessary? in this kind of application? Would that be part of what uh, would be part of the partnership, if you like? We've not requested a dime for this. We've paid for all of this out of pocket. We actually haven't done any fundraising for this. This has all been out of um, our operating to date. Yeah, but uh, if, if the, the community, community board-, board yeah, I, I'm talking, okay, I, I heard okay. your question. If the community board would choose to contribute, we would not refuse that, but we're not requiring that. As, as a term of signing on at all. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Melissa. Sure. So I'm uh, conflicted here because my firm represents the owner of the site. So I'm just stating that and you know my views are my own. Um, I'm just curious about the assumptions that went into crafting the tower forms that uh, you all showed and sort of, um, you know, what informs that? Is it is it taking like bulk from the landmark sites and, um, are we assuming sort of that they would, you know, go for the tallest tower 
possible. I'm just kind of curious what informed that. And then a question, I guess, more for the board is, is there precedent for a community board signing on to a ULERP application like this? I don't know that I've seen it before, but I'm curious, so. Um, sure, uh, okay, so this, so we've tried to take tower forms that exist, like things that people do, right? So um, 432 Park Avenue, the floor plates are very similar to 432 Park Avenue and Central Park Tower. So if you look at those two buildings, their floor plates and their floor to floor heights, are, they're similar to this. And also the, you know, the, the, the inner building voids and the way they're spaced, they're very similar to those. Um, so this is like, this is not a, so just amassing that kind of copies <laughs> off of those others. I don't want to like, this is not a design, right? <laughs> I want to be very clear about that. This is a massing that copies other buildings like this. And the idea uh, in terms of the assumptions is that the landmark buildings stay. Um, they actually stay as commercial um, uh, uses. You know, the, the idea was, you know, this is a generic action. We don't know what's going to happen, but they're landmarks, right? They're not going to be torn down. They're already outfitted for commercial purposes. And so they may very well stay in that. And there's nothing in the zoning that would prevent that, right? It, it, the zoning is C47. It allows um, commercial uses. And so that would stay. And then uh, I, actually, I can ask, answer the other one. CB3 right now is currently a co-applicant for the Two Bridges rezoning application. Um, it doesn't happen often anymore. I think it used to happen more, um, but you're right. It's not common. Okay. Uh, George, this is, uh, so would you say this is the, the reasonable worst case scenario? Uh, I, this is <laughs> um, the, the reasonable worst case, uh, no action scenario is this. Yes. And then the reasonable worst case with action scenario when you change the zoning would be this. Full build out, this, they're both like 12 FAR on the site. Um, but, and again, you know, these are not small buildings. I just, you know, they look small compared to these. They're still pretty big. Okay. Um, I, I, I've been wanting to join this application for a couple of years. Or, it makes incredible sense. It, it, I don't see an argument against it. Um, and I recommend that uh, the, 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 that the committee um, a vote to join the application. I don't know whether, I haven't thought about whether we need a full board resolution or not at this point. I do have one question though, yes. uh, either George or Sean or Paige. Um, is money available to an EIS? Is an EIS necessary and is money available? Um, so a full EIS should not be necessary. Um, you have to do it because remember that the action is really small, right? This is not like, right, it's just this. <laughs> and the amount of FAR does not change, right? So so it should, it should be get a, uh, it should get a nag deck. We should be able to do an environmental assessment. So you got to do, you know, the short form, right? You know, and, and so, um, you know, this sort of thing, this sort of thing shouldn't cost very much, right? You know, they do cost a lot, but I'm thinking that, you know, we're trying to do this without an attorney. Um, we're trying to do this. It's as simple as possible. Um, you don't need an attorney to do something like this. They didn't used to always have to have attorneys representing people. Um, and so hopefully we can do it at relatively affordable. They're hiring me for goodness sake, you know, <laughs> not exactly the most expensive consultant out there. So um, it's a that, terrible precedent to eliminate attorneys from the process. <laughs> you know, I, you don't, there's nothing that requires you have to have an attorney for these things, right? There's absolutely nothing. Richard, you just volunteer your services. Wait, wait a minute. Can we, can we take the image off the screen? Oh, of course. Put it back to people. And then, uh, Mark, are there any community questions from the audience or are we? Uh, we haven't invited the audience to do so, but I don't see any hands at present. Um, okay. And, and I'm just scrolling through um, the names and uh, no, I don't see any hands raised at this point, 
but you might invite folks to raise hands if they wish to in order to be called on if that's the way you want to call on folks. Yes. Um, I guess Steve has his hand up. Why don't we start with Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been here. Unfortunately, I've had to have my uh, not do our best, uh, what our best practices are and have my camera off for a logistical reason. But um, look, the only thing that I would add to Richard's point is I would think, Richard, uh, since you're the parliamentarian, if we're not sure whether we do a resolution or a vote, my sense is perhaps there is a brief resolution to support this and then we would vote on that and then you'd have it both covered. But I do think we should take it to vote um, and would be the way, way to do it, whatever way to rise that. But I think that we've had this meeting. I think it's been a full presentation. We're getting community involvement. It's been it's been uh, put up and due notice. So I would just support a vote on it the best way that we think we should do that. And that's just my suggestion. And let's put it to a vote, you know, and, and um, there'll be further feedback at a full board. That was just what I would add to it. I, I think that's right. Um, uh, all right, so just a couple more questions. Shelly, you haven't spoke. Did you have a... Well, it was really co comments, okay? So first, uh, of course, we can enter into a, um, into a ULERP. We've done it before, so Excellent. there's no problem. We did the rezoning, uh, uh, major uh, Upper West Side rezoning. Second, um, there are two compelling uh, pieces here. One that the site would have been a part of the special district, but the accommodation was made. The accommodation was made for a specific institution and purpose, and that no, no longer is operational or, or, or real. And so there's no reason to have it. And second, the potential as we've seen, as, as George James showed us so clearly, could be for something that would be extremely negative, ha have extremely negative impact on the community. So I don't see a problem with it. And I think that the great work that's been done already, Landmarks West and George, um, uh, lays the groundwork for what's necessary. And it isn't a big project. So we're not going to be spending, you know, hour, you know, a million hours on it. So I'm all for going ahead with a vote and uh, approving it, approving our engaging with Landmarks West in support of, of this uh, application for ULERP. Thank you, uh, Paige. Uh, just to say thank you to George because um, he's been holding our board's hands. Um, everybody's been sweating bullets. Nobody's been able to sleep um, uh, because we didn't know the right time to do this, but as George says, we're only moving a little black line back to where it was. And I mean, I'm, I'm quoting George here. It's <laughs> highly technical information. And it was Sean well, taking Page, notes. black lines matter. I know, I know. Thank you. I was yeah. going to do that, but I thought Sorry. Shelly was gonna say it. <laughs> anyway, I'll keep my mouth shut. I'm just so relieved that I can now answer your questions. Sean and I are available. Um, we will be putting it up on the website. Um, and I apologize that we've been doing it sort of surreptitiously, but George has been finessing this. As I said, it's been at 18 months of bliss working with you, George. So thank you very much for hanging in there. And I appreciate all of your sentiments. This is very reassuring um, to try to um, make good architecture, good planning for the West Side. Thanks. Is there, is there any reason not to vote on the principle of joining this application now? Uh, we can craft a one or two line resolution but, and pass it around, but the, the sentiment would be to join in the application of Landmark West. So moved. Yes, please. Yes. But I think it should go to the yeah. full board, right? Sorry? Yeah. It definitely should be on the full board. So. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we need a resolution. We need a second. Yes. Okay. All those in favor. Aye. You can, you can raise your yellow hands. Or... I mean, you just may want to do just committee members and non-committee members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not there, so. Committee first. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, 
seven, uh, eight. Okay, uh, opposed. Excuse me, Richard. Did you, I assume the eight includes Louisa and uh, Ethel who were raising their hands? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I think I, it includes Louisa. I, I didn't see Ethel. Yeah, I, I had my hand. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll put the right. yellow. I have Let my me hand. try it again. Let me, let's try it again. One, okay. two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. All those opposed. Wait, I yeah. um, I didn't I didn't get that number, but I'm sorry. I Let's have put together, and I'll, I'll just do as well. Bunch of everyone should use their digital hands. If you don't use your digital, don't raise your hand and use your digital hand. Everyone uses a digital hand. If for some reason you're uncomfortable with the digital hand, raise your hand. So we're not doing both. So I see eight digital hands now, and anybody else raising their hand and not using a digital? We have Sima. Roberta, are you, I, you, are you technically a member? Because on the website, it says I, you're not. I am, but I'm not sure that they put me on. Roberta was a member of the committee since when I was chair. Oh, okay. Because on the website, it That's doesn't show true. it. But they, but they should be, I should be. Okay. All right. are, are board members of Landmark West conflicted out of voting? Yes, they should be. Okay. okay. It's a fair point. Paige, did you vote or not? Okay. No, uh, I'm recusing myself for a potential conflict. Okay. You All those opposed, put your hands down or lower hand or whatever. Uh, All those opposed, seeing none, abstaining, none, and for cause, one. Page, yes. Okay. I'm Wait, sorry. The, there are hey, two, Melissa, there's two. two. Melissa. Melissa yeah. had uh, something to say. I'm sorry, yeah. It's two abstainings, Melissa okay. and Paige. No, and two abstaining for cause. Okay. Yeah. Ineligible, Ineligible, yeah. Ineligible, not abstaining, right? Yeah. All right. All right. Um, Wait, on yeah. non committee members. Right? Yes, non-committee members should now vote. Uh, Melissa, you need to put your hand down. <laughs> uh, I, I have one, one two, two, three, four, three, four, five. I have five. Okay, hands down. And any abstain or for cost non-committee okay okay guys thank you very much we will get the tally straight in our meeting minutes yeah. and resolution you time uh, and can we can you send over a copy of of sort of the applica the draft application for us to look at um, or the material, anything you wanna share besides a PowerPoint before the full board? Yeah, Sean, I can pro pro provide it to you and you can send it along. Thank you. You, you can send it to uh, Stephen or to Richard and me, it's up to you. All right, and we we'll probably, George, we'll probably, we will vote on it at our early May meeting. So we'll be on board in May, in early May. First Tuesday in May. Yep. Assuming, assuming that the board doesn't overrule the committee. Well, the May board 4th. will be on board. <laughs> any, any new business? Okay, thanks everybody for uh, patience, cooperation, uh, Thank hearing. You. That's it. Motion to adjourn. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Night. Be well. <laughs>